Well, hey, good morning, church. My name is Clayton. I'm one of the pastors here. If we haven't met, uh, thank you for joining and choosing fellowship today. Hey, we are gonna continue in our Philippians series. Uh, As we, we're gonna be in chapter four. We're gonna round third and head for home. There's only a couple more sermons left in our our Philippians series. So Philippians four, uh, verses one through seven is where we're gonna be today. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Philippians four, verses one through seven. Uh, So it was one summer day. I was probably around third or fourth grade. I don't exactly remember. Uh, But my family, we met uh, with some other family at a public pool uh, in in a different town. And so we went there and we were having a good time and all was fine. There might have been a little bit of cloud cover, but nothing was weird. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of us having fun at the pool, uh, the tornado sirens go off in, uh, in town, which was strange because there was nothing obvious uh, going on. So we gather up our things and we begin to head out. And I mean, within less than five minutes, you could see that storm front there. I mean, there was 60 mile an hour winds. The rain was, it was torrential downpour. And uh, I mean, everybody just scattering like roaches with the light turn on. I mean, everybody was freaking out. Uh, the pool house was full. And you know, I was with my dad and we had nowhere to go. So my dad finds the next closest thing in the middle of all of the chaos. Uh, The next best thing was underneath a bridge and we weren't the only ones. And so we go underneath this bridge and it was a low bridge. It was wide. So, uh, because there was just a a, a creek that went under, it wasn't like a big river or anything. So it, it was just, it was a dry creek bed or a mostly dry creek bed. And so we get under there, but what we didn't realize or understand in the middle of everything was, um, upstream, it was pouring down rain like it was here. So we are in, underneath this bridge and tornado sirens are going off. Wind is going crazy. It is pouring down rain and the creek starts to rise while we're underneath the bridge. I'm third, fourth grade. I'm freaking out, okay? I am absolutely uh, going bonkers. Um, and, but during all of the chaos of the tornado sirens, the wind, and even the water rising, I, I, there was some semblance of peace and comfort because I was with my dad the whole time. Right now, I really do like to think, you know, in my uh, exceptional third grade athleticism, like I was the one keeping up with my dad. Uh, But the reality is, is that's not true. My dad was never going to lose me. Right. He was, that's not going to happen. He didn't like, he wasn't running for the bridge and I'm behind him like, keep up. Don't let the tornado get you. And he's just like, he taken off and expecting me to catch up. That's, that's weird. That's not going to happen. I was with my dad the whole entire time. He was with me underneath the bridge during the storm, the winds and the water rising. He was with me the whole time. Paul in our passage is going to describe Jesus like that. He's going to describe Jesus like that, that he is always near. The exact phrase that he will use right in the middle of our passage is the Lord is at hand. Another word for, to say that is the Lord is near. It's the exact phrase he's going to use. And Paul, I'm hoping that he will do this for you as it has happened for me, that he's going to shepherd our hearts and our minds that the Lord is always near. And in four ways, in conflict, rejoicing, anxiety, and in peace. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive into God's word. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you for each and every person here. Lord, stir our affections for you. I pray that uh, this scripture would shepherd the hearts and minds of a church that I dearly love as it has for me this week. Father, I pray that you would think with my mind and my words would be your words. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. So we'll start in verses one through three. The Lord is at hand in conflict. Verses one through three. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. The therefore that you see in verse one is from what Pastor Justin talked about last week, that there is a gospel striving not to earn grace, but because of grace. Uh, To quote my doppelganger, Alex Barnett, he says this, God is not anti-effort, he is anti-earning. And because we have been given grace by Jesus, Paul wants us to remind us to live out our identity in Jesus. 
He says, my brothers in Christ, whom I love. He says, you are my joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord. Why? Because you are loved. I mean, what a phenomenal verse that is for you to remind us of our identity in Christ. Paul is doing that. He's reminding them of who they are in Christ because your identity will inform your conflicts. So here in our passage, uh, Paul addresses the conflict between uh, two women, Euodia and, and, and Syntyche. And it didn't stay between the two. It rose to the level of the whole church getting involved. Now, it was a small church, to be fair. Still, nonetheless, it didn't stay between them. The whole church was involved. And then even more than that, you know, Paul felt strongly enough to write it in his letter from prison to the church at Philippi to address the situation. Now, we don't know the specifics of their conflict, but we do know what Paul does is give a plan of action to resolve that conflict. He says, one of the first things that he says is, uh, you need a third party to get involved into your conflict. That third party, he says, is true companion. We don't know who this person is, but if Paul gives you a, a nickname called true companion, you're good to go, okay? So here's true companion. He, uh, he or she jumps in to uh, try to mitigate this situation um, uh, to resolve the conflict. And, and he says, listen, we do this because you're Christians. You have labored side by side with me in the gospel. So I'm going to ask you to do just this one thing. This one thing is this. Agree in the Lord. Agree in the Lord. Now, if I could summarize it, it would be, to keep the main thing, the main thing. Focus on Jesus. Don't divide over secondary issues. They're both believers in Jesus, so keep Jesus at the center. And inevitably, when you keep Jesus at the center, there's going to have to be preferences. They're just gonna have to die. Now, there are things that we do stand firm on. Like there's essential doctrines that we believe as Christians, you know, Jesus is God. He, Jesus lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death in our place for our sins. Three days later, he rose from the grave to give us life. The, uh, we believe in, in a, a triune God. All of those things, some of uh, those are just some, but all of those things are things that we're gonna stand firm on. We're not wavering. They're rooted in scripture and those are unchanging. We stand firm on those. That's not what is in view here. Okay? They are at best secondary issues that have elevated to primary issues. And Paul wants a third party to get involved so they can attack the problem and not the person. To attack the problem and not the person. Because unhealthy conflict will attack the person and not the problem. This is why Paul starts to, uh, uh, in verse one, addresses, reminds them who they are in Christ, that they're loved, that their identity is in Jesus because your identity will inform your conflict. Because when you are in Christ and that is your identity, you, be, you can begin to have healthy conflict and attack the problem and not the person. Did I just get all up in your marriage just for a hot moment or, or some friendships or maybe even for some coworkers? Because when we forget our identity in Jesus, what happens is we begin to attack the person to build ourselves up and we want to win through dominance instead of actually trying to find some sort of resolution for the problem. Okay, your identity informs your conflicts. So here's some questions. You can go over these in your times with the Lord because uh, there's gonna be several more come up uh, in your life group or your discipleship group. So question, what informs your conflicts? How can you trust the Lord in the area of conflict? Does your past experience, is that the only thing that informs how you argue and engage in conflict? Is it a sin that you caused? Is it sin that happened to you? Or do we just need to be reminded of who we are in Christ and what Christ did on the cross for us to engage in conflict? See, ultimately, the conflict gets resolved because they're remembering what Christ did on the cross and doing what Paul says, agree in the Lord. Because listen, there's a lot of people here. We are going to disagree on some things, aren't we? We're going to, like, I don't know, the color of the carpet or preaching style or music from the stage, musical preferences or which service is best to attend. And since I'm preaching this one, it's this service is the best one to attend. He says, we agree in the Lord. And he says, why? 
because our names are written in the book of life. Now, that is a specific reference to your salvation in Jesus. And that salvation in Jesus should cause you to rejoice, which is where Paul takes us in verses four and five. The Lord is at hand in rejoicing. Verse four and five, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Here's our phrase in the middle of our passage. The Lord is at hand. So listen, I, I, I really want you to get this. As you are in Christ, God's disposition toward you is one of delight. Do you understand that? You might be thinking, well, not for me, not pause. Yes, you. God's disposition toward you is one of delight. He does not have a furrowed brow, arms crossed, or maybe a crooked finger pointed at you just going, you need to be better. Just hurry it up. Now, all of us in some capacity feel like we should be further along than what we are. We wish that we were more kind or more patient or more loving or insert whatever we want more of. And you're like, well, God will, he might love me more then. No, false. God loves you now, even in all of the mess. And that should cause us to rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Now, in our cultural moment, I want to just briefly distinguish happiness and joy because happiness is simply a product of circumstance. Joy is a product of perspective that is rooted in Jesus. And sometimes we try to find our fulfillment in a whole lot of other things other than Jesus, like our health or relationships or our job or our money or insert the thing that it is for you. But those things are not going to hold up or be your source of strength in the day of trouble. Nehemiah 8.10 says this, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, and that rejoicing should lead to your reasonableness. See, Paul here is echoing Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus says, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, your rejoicing and your reasonableness. Uh, for some of us, uh, this is one of the two, rejoicing and reasonableness, is so we're wired that way. It's easier for us to lean one way or the other because of, that's just how we are or could be the tradition that we grew up in if, if you grew up in church. So for some of us, rejoicing, super easy. Because y'all grew up and there was clapping, there was, you know, maybe some stomping and, 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 you know, your worship isn't complete without various hand motions and raises or maybe even a tear streaming down your cheek. It's not really complete until those things all take place. For others of us, you know, Christianity might be more of an intellectual exercise where you pontificate the theological implications of your eschatological preferences. Listen, either way, either way, Paul says you do both. You do both. Think of it like a sailboat. Uh, the wind in the sails are your emotional life. And, and uh, the rudder to steer the sailboat is your reasonableness. And let me say it's rooted in God's word, not your own intelligence. It's rooted in God's word. So if you have uh, only wind in the sails with no rudder, you will be emotionally out of control. You don't know which way it's going to go. You will capsize and crash and things will not go well. If you have all of the sails down, there's no wind, but you have a rudder. Where are you going? Nowhere. I mean, you might know all of the ins and outs of the sailboat and including the rudder, but you're not going to go anywhere. Paul says, rejoice and be reasonable. Do both. Why? Because the Lord is near to you. Because the Lord is at hand. So question. What is the thing that is robbing you of true joy in the Lord? And how can you trust the Lord in your heart and mind with your rejoicing and your emotions and your reasonableness? Is it distraction? Are you just constantly trying to distract yourself from whatever it is going on in your life? Is it uh, you're trying to earn uh, you're trying to use your morality to earn points or favor with God? Is it your politics? Is it sin that you're unwilling to repent of? I mean, you feel shame about it, but you keep it hanging around. You're not killing that sin. Either way, here's what I know. Because the Lord is near, he is actually after your joy by giving you himself. He is after your joy by giving you himself. 
That's where it's rooted in and found in. And because he's after your joy, Paul gives us a plan for one of the things that most of us will probably experience that robs us of joy, and that's anxiety. So Paul says in verse 6, the Lord is at hand in anxiety. Verse 6, he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, here's what I don't want you to hear as you read, don't be anxious, is, uh, is, is just that Paul is just logically telling you, hey, you just need to quit it. Because some of you, if you read it like that, you're going to go, oh, Paul, thank you. Uh, I've never actually thought about that. So thank you. When I've been anxious, if, I, if someone would have just told me to quit, I would have done it. I'm, now's the day, I guess. I'm just going to, oh, I'm done now. I stop. That's not it. Don't read it like that. Read it. Don't be anxious. Why? And because the Lord is near through prayer. The Lord is near through prayer. Paul knows that anxiety is an emotional problem that requires an emotional solution. Now, let me put some definitions on this before we go any further. Uh, Dr. John Deloney, he's an expert in mental health and, and anxiety. He defines anxiety as an alarm system for your body. He says, it's an alarm system for your central nervous system. That a situation or circumstance is not how it should be. Really, if you think about it, it is a brilliant way to describe, I believe, God's way of reminding us that life is not as it should be. We are sinful, broken people living in a sinful, broken world with other sinful and broken people. It makes sense that things are not as they should be. So... Let me give you an example of a right fire alarm going off when there's a fire from Scripture involving Jesus. Uh, John chapter 17, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is praying. He knows what lies ahead for him, which he's going to be tortured. He's going to die uh, on the cross for the sins of the world. So he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is praying. And he is so stressed out and so anxious. Scripture says that he is sweating uh, drops of blood. He's lifting his request. He wants them to be made known to God. And then he begins to sweat drops of blood. Now, I have seen this in past power lifters, where they're lifting an extreme amount of weight, and the capillaries in the sweat glands burst. And then so they'll start bleeding out of random places. So they'll be lifting weight, and their body is under such, t uh, ten uh, under such tension and such pressure that blood will just start coming out of their shoulder or their chest or their cheeks or there's just these random places because the capillaries burst in the sweat glands. Now, Jesus is not a power lifter. He's praying. Okay? And he's under so much anxiety and so much stress because he knows that he's getting ready to be brutally tortured. He's going to go to the cross, be nailed to it, absorb all of God's wrath for your sin and mine that should be ours. He's going to absorb it and he's going to die. Now, I don't know what that's like. I've never been there and I won't be. My guess, you got a right to be anxious, Right, like you know what's getting ready to happen. It, it, that is the plan that has set before you. Jesus is anxious. And so here, I want you to see not every single anxiety is sinful because Jesus was sinless and experienced it. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul is talking about an anxiety from undue concern that has monopolized the heart and the mind. So a fire alarm should be going off when there's a fire. Fire alarms should not be going off when there is no fire. Paul is talking about the fire alarms that are constantly going off when there is no fire. And each person, to varying degrees, has fire alarms going off either a little or a lot. Now, I want to say this briefly. What I am not talking about and what Paul is not referencing is anxiety that is properly medically diagnosed for a particular mental condition. That's a separate conversation for a separate day. Paul is talking about the vast majority of people who experience anxiety to varying degrees, whether it's a little or maybe even extreme. Or another way to put it, the undue concern that monopolizes the heart and the mind. And Paul tells us what to do with those anxieties. He says, you let your requests be made known to God through prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. You pray. Now, that means this. When you're anxious and anxiousness comes up, you don't get a hold of those and shove it down and stuff it. Men, do you hear me? 
Actually, the exact opposite is true. Scripture says you bring them up. You let your requests be made known to God. That's how you bring them up. And this is what prayer does. Prayer sometimes uh, will bring resolution to whatever you're praying for. We ask God to move. We ask God to do certain things, and he might do it immediately. He might do it over time. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes God says, uh, not now, and we're gonna, I, I got a different way that I'm going to do things, and all of that is fine. But what prayer always does every time is draw you close to the Father. It draws you in relationally close because Paul understands that the anxiety of undue concern that monopolizes the heart and the mind requires an emotional solution. So Paul says to draw near to the Lord, turn your face to God in prayer. See, often, maybe you're like me, when anxiety hits, we need, to, like, we need to focus on the problem so we can get a solution, so we can prepare for the worst. We need to get in there, and we unintentionally turn our back on the Lord, and we may not say this out loud, but we'll say it with our life, that I can't pray right now, I can't do these things because I need to focus on this problem. Now, I would say this, you may be active in the problem, but you're not productive in the problem because Paul says What is productive, the most productive thing to do is to take a break for a moment, turn around away from your circumstances, get face to face with Jesus and let your concerns be made known through prayer because prayer will always bring you relationally close to Jesus. Paul here is presenting us with two options. Will we worry or will we worship? And every time anxiety goes off, if the fire alarms go off in your head, That is a a call to pray. And I promise you, Jesus is always near and will be relationally close even in your anxiety. Let me show you what I mean. Um, Inside Out 2, phenomenal movie. It's a great movie. Uh, The movie is about a, a girl named Riley, but Riley is not the star of the movie. It is the emotions that are characterized that are going on in her brain. So the, the first movie is, uh, uh, it has your basic emotions of fear, there's joy, there's uh, disgust, there's sadness. That's in the first movie. In the second movie, she's a little bit older, and then there's new emotions that come in, like embarrassment, envy, and the star emotion of Inside Out 2 is anxiety, okay? It's anxiety, which is, that's a great picture. So we went as a family, and my son leans over to me in the middle of the movie and goes, Dad, anxiety is crazy. And I lean over to him, I go, buddy, you have no idea how true that statement is. <laughs> like, that is so wise and so observant, because that is exactly right. Anxiety is insane, So to spoil the movie, only a tiny bit, because I'm leaving a whole lot out, to be fair, and it's been out for six weeks. So if you haven't seen it, that's kind of on you. (laughs) So I'm only going to spoil it just a tiny bit, but you'll get to go see, you'll get to go see the rest of it, uh, uh, because there's a lot that takes place. Anyway, anxiety, in the moment I'm talking about, anxiety has taken over Riley, and she is in full-blown anxiety attack, panic attack. And, and, And before that happens, the emotion anxiety sent all of the other emotions away, except one envy. Because even if you've noticed in your own life, when anxiety dominates you and takes over, envy is anxiety's best friend. And they like to hang out together. So anxiety has uh, taken over. And through the course of the movie, the the emotions are trying to get back to, uh, in the movie, it's called headquarters, the brain, for them to uh, get control of Riley and stop this anxiety attack. So the emotions come back and they're all yelling at anxiety, uh, logically trying to implore with anxiety. Anxiety, stop, stop. You got to quit. You got to let Riley go. And no avail. Like anxiety is paying attention to no logical appeal at all. It wasn't until at one moment uh, it clicks for only the emotion joy. And what joy does, joy uh, breaks through all of the chaos that anxiety has created. And even at one point, joy goes, anxiety, stop. And anxiety ain't having it. And then joy gets it. Joy goes, okay, and leans in really close to anxiety and says this, anxiety, you don't get to choose who Riley is. Ooh, what a line. I mean, it was so good. And then, of course, it's a movie. Uh, she calms down. Everything's fine. Okay, so, uh, but there's a lot there. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you go finish that movie out. But, fr- friends, this is what I want you to see. 
inside out too is only but a shadow of a far more real reality of what we have in Jesus. See, when our anxieties begin to dominate and the fire alarms are going haywire, what we need most is for joy to break through the chaos of anxiety to go, you don't get to decide who they are, okay? Listen, friends, what is vaguely defined as joy in Inside Out 2 is so clearly defined in Christianity because we have a God who has joy, who is joy, and his name is Jesus. It's clearly defined in, in, in Christianity. This is the reality of what Paul points us to, that the Lord is near even when you are anxious. We can let our requests be made known to God and then joy gets to break through all of the anxiety. So questions. What are you anxious about? And then pick a time. When will you let your requests be made known to God? Write them down. Write your anxieties down and give them, pick a time, give them to Jesus through prayer. Turn your back on all of your circumstances for a moment, the things that you're anxious about. Turn your back on them, turn toward Jesus, get face to face with Jesus through prayer because he is after your joy by giving you himself through prayer. So then we get to rejoice in the Lord. And Paul, what he does is he gives, a, he gives us a result of what takes place when this happens. The result is verse 7. The Lord is at hand, so be at peace. Verse 7. He says, And the peace of God, listen to this, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, Paul says, the peace of God which surpasses our own understanding. We don't exactly understand what it is. It's gonna guard our hearts and minds. This peace of God guards your rejoicing and your reasonableness. It, this peace of God guards the wind and the sails and the rudder, even in the midst of chaos. Now, if you're like me, you may have memorized these verses as a good bit of information, but it has never led to transformation. Because what happens for some of us Peace only lasts as long as the workout is. Peace will only last until the last bite of food on the plate. It will only last until we're done scrolling on social media or until we finish that show. And then we're back to reality, longing for a peace that is never found in any of those things that can only be found in Jesus. We just need to turn around because he's been near to you the whole time. Questions? Where are you trying to find peace that isn't in Jesus? I, a, one of my counselors asked me this and it messed me up, so you're welcome, okay? How will you trust the Lord to be your source of peace? Uh, it was roughly uh, about a, a year and a half ago-ish, uh, I don't remember when, where this, these verses became uh, more than information, they became transformation for me. Uh, the past three years have been, uh, has presented a lot of challenges for my family and I, things that we just uh, have never encountered before, so they've been difficult. And so I, through this process, I began to notice I was routinely starting to feel anxious, and this was out of character for me. And so I began to, like any person, starts Googling and trying to figure out ways to mitigate anxiety, right? And so I, you can mit mitigate anxiety through breath work. So I was practicing some, so, some breath work to calm down. You can uh, have a high-protein, high-fat breakfast with no carbs. That is going to help reduce anxiety. You can exercise, we can, and we could keep going because there's all sorts of ways to do this. But the problem was, I still had a hole in the bucket. You know, I, 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 it wasn't getting full. And, you know, through some other counseling, I was figuring out that I was placing, trying to find peace and all of these other things except for the source of peace, which is Jesus. But uh, at this one particular time, I had been anxious enough and uh, panic attack a couple of times to figure out, like, when it was starting to come on. And so this one day in particular, I was, you know, I was kind of getting fidgety. And I'm like, I mean, all the things, I was thinking about all the things. And um, I was like, okay, well, I don't know what this is yet. Maybe I'm just going to go get a snack because food, right? It's, it's going to solve stuff. So, uh, so I, I walk into the pantry, 
bam, full on panic attack. Put my hand on the shelf. I put my hand on my chest. I mean, I was feeling heart palpitations. I mean, the only, I mean, I, it was this weird sensation. The best way I could describe it was my brain was just scrambled. I was thinking about all of the things that could be what was going, how I couldn't fix all of the things. And now I was in full panic attack and I didn't even get a snack. I was just standing in the pantry, like bent over, trying to figure out what is going on. I need to cry in the pantry by myself, not in front of all, all these people, um, like a regular person. So, um, and then the Holy Spirit was so kind and brought these verses to mind. And so I'm, I'm in the pantry and I take a big deep breath through my nose because I've already practiced breath work, except this time I didn't just leave it at breath work. I started to pray. God, I can't control that. It's messing me up. I can't fix this. Little by little, I began to let my requests be made known to God. And, and, and at that point, I had sort of a resolve of, God, you promised this. And I'm, gonna, I'm not leaving until your promise is there. So I just kept praying. I just kept praying, God, take care of this. I can't control this. No matter how the chips may fall, whether it's in my favor or not, I know you're going to be in the storm just like my dad was. You're not going anywhere. And so I just kept praying. And then little by little, there began to have a peace that surpassed all understanding. And what I mean by that is nothing about my situation was actually fixed. There was actually reason to worry. There was reason to be concerned. I couldn't fix those things. This, my situation wasn't fixed at all. But what did happen is I got close to Jesus, who was there the whole time. And in that moment, I turned my back on my circumstances and I turned around and I got face to face with Jesus through prayer. And it was in that moment that joy broke through the chaos of anxiety. And I began to have a peace that surpassed all understanding. And then it was after that, I actually had a clear mind to be able to tackle my problems. Because there was plenty. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm anxiety free. It doesn't mean that everything is fixed and I'm cured, but what it does mean is that I know that I know that I know that I have a God whose yoke is easy and his burden is light. And I'm going to give those things to him because he's strong enough to carry them. I'm telling you, through prayer and God's word and actually believing God's word, your life can actually be transformed. Let me give you an example I like tea. I like jasmine with a little bit of honey, to be exact. There are people who drink tea uh, who can't enjoy their tea because they are called what I'll call dippers. They go in and out. This is a godless way to approach tea and to drink tea. So they go in and out, in and out. The problem is with dippers is the tea leaves have no time to actually change anything about the water, right? Right? Because they're coming in and out. Now, listen, some of us have lived our Christian life just like that. In and out. In and out. Uh, Jesus did not step down out of heaven, live the perfect life that you and I should have lived, die the death that we should have died in our place for our sins, go to the cross, absorb all of God's wrath for your sin and mine, die, three days later rise again, arise from the grave, and when we repent of our sins, turn toward Jesus to actually give us life and salvation to where we're sealed in him. He didn't do all of that so we could dip in and out. And here's the most unbelievable news for some of us, because we, at, some, at, at some point, we're all dippers. God is so good to you 
and so kind and so loving, he pursues you even when you dip out. That's good news for somebody in here who's been dipping out. But listen, the best way to enjoy tea is to let it sit, to marinate, or uh, to use uh, the language from scripture, to let it abide in the water. Because when it let it sit, over time, what you will notice is that the water takes on the contents, the character uh, of the tea leaves. And it becomes something altogether together different. It's not just water. See, this is what it is like for the Christian when we sit with God in prayer through his word and actually believe it and live it out. And it's because the Lord is near that we can engage in conflict because our identity is in Jesus, not in what happened to us. Because the Lord is near, we can actually rejoice in the dark days because our joy is not found in our circumstance. It is found in who Jesus is. Because the Lord is near, we can trust God in our anxiety and lift our and make our requests known to him. It is because the Lord is near, that we can have peace when it makes absolutely no sense because our peace is not found in the circumstance, it is found in Jesus. Some of us have been chasing the wrong things, trying to find Jesus in all the wrong places, when in reality, what we need to do is just pause, turn around, maybe open up God's word, because he's been there the whole time. Question is for you this morning, will you turn around? Will you Pray to the God who has been near this whole time. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the cross. Lord, you made a way when there was no way. You forgive us when we couldn't do it ourselves. You gave us grace when when we could not earn any of it. Jesus, thank you for what you did. Father, we love you. I pray that we would lift our anxieties to you. Lord, that we would know who we are in you so we can engage in conflict. We can rejoice. We can lift, make our requests known and have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Jesus, we love you and it's in your name. Amen.